Hi, I'm Dr. Peter Enns. I'm Senior Fellow in Biblical Studies at the BioLogos Foundation. And we're here today with uh, the Reverend Dr. Tom Wright. And we have a chance to ask some questions, some of which we've gotten uh, via Twitter and emails. Uh, and also about a lot of topics such as his recent book, After You Believe, and uh, science and faith issues. So uh, welcome, Tom. Uh, Thank you. Good, good to, to see you, you again. Yeah. Tom, your latest book, um, After You Believe, uh, what are you trying to accomplish in that book? Why did you write it? I wrote it because I became fascinated a few years ago by the way in which the vision of God's purpose to put all things right at the end actually affects what we loosely call the moral life. So many Christians think simply in terms of people being good or bad so that they'll go to heaven or hell, and then good evangelical or reformed Christians think, well, I shouldn't be thinking about me being good because it's all got to be of God's grace and I mustn't be earning my own salvation. So there's all sorts of confusion, which gets muddled up with the confusion in our culture between how do you know what is right to do? Do you have a bunch of rules which you try to keep? Do you figure out the greatest happiness of the greatest number and try and do a kind of calculation when you're faced with a moral dilemma? Or is it simply a matter of letting it all hang out? I'm basically a good person, so all I have to do is to be true to myself, to live authentically, and then it'll all work. And I, I want to say all those options are bad options. Rules alone are pretty bad for you. They're better than chaos, but they're pretty bad for you. They will stultify you. They won't enable you to grow up, to take responsibility for your life. Indeed, they'll prevent that. So how then do we live? And I want to retrieve the ancient idea, which is right there in the middle of Scripture, of character, of virtue. Not virtue in exactly the Aristotle sense, where here is this great noble human being who um, decides he's going to develop certain character strengths, there's always a he, so that he can be a leader in the state and he can be a leader in the army and so on, and can be proud of doing so. What we see in the New Testament is that whole idea put to death in Jesus and then brought to new life again. There is such a thing as character development. You only get it when the grace and faith thing has well and truly happened, because we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit here, we're talking about um, faith, hope, and love, as in 1 Corinthians 13, and we're talking particularly about what Paul says in Romans 5 when he talks about character. He says, hope does not disappoint us. Why not? Because, well, here is this hope of a fully human existence. And he says, here are the steps towards that fully human existence. Here are the character strengths that you are called to develop towards that. And I find that vision of the Christian moral life um, enormously compelling, actually very exciting. And so I think if you frame the question of morality within a biblical eschatology, a vision of what the real end is, then all sorts of things can start to grow within us which make us the people God wants us to be. And you said something very interesting that I want to follow up on that. Um, is character building something that makes us truly Christian or does it make us truly human? It I think you said the latter. It, but it has to be both. And the point of being Christian is that God wants us to be people, not puppets. He wants us to be fully human beings. That's why one of the keys to this is thinking. Paul says you must be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And the thing about um, so many ethical systems is that you wait to do the thinking until you're in the crisis. The thing about virtue ethics is that the thinking is done up front.